Atlantic language. Kate, uh, as strong as Carol is, something that Todd just mentioned is her vulnerability. I think that a lot of the keys to the character is both the vulnerability, the fear, the sense of being in a time and place that she maybe isn't able to get out of. There's moments when she asks Therese, is that what you want to be, a photographer? And those are, you kind of get the feeling that those are questions no one ever asked of Carol. What were some of the keys for you as you approached the character? Uh, I think my question is that she had asked that, that she hadn't been asked, that she hadn't asked herself. I mean, I think Carol's a deeply private person whose who's, um, who's sexuality and a relationship to her, herself is not unsettled or um, ambiguous, but um, she, she lives in a, play, in a quiet hell because she's not able to fully express herself. I guess with the way she brought up, but also she hasn't, um, and she has not been in a loveless, everyone keeps describing it as a loveless marriage. I think the, the complicated thing for Carol is, uh, and being confronted by, by Therese at the time in her life that it is, is that she's got an enormous amount to lose. Um, she's found a sort of a, an unhappy balance with, with um, if you can find an unhappy balance with Carl Chandler, I don't know, it's very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Um, but with but with Hajj, because of her love for her daughter, and so she's got a lot. She's risking um, a lot, and I think that that's. It was a beautiful line that, that Phyllis wrote, you know, that you know, that describing Therese as being flung out of space. But I also think Carol's describing that situation of being in uncharted territory, free, free floating, as you do when you fall in love with anyone for the first time. You feel like you've never been here before. You're being confronted with questions, being confronted with signs of yourself, as Todd suggests, that you, um, you've played t territory you've never, yeah, never been in before. Rue, Therese is often seen in frames or boxes on screen. She sort of needs to break, things she needs to break out of in order to be herself. She's often framed by, by windows or by, by her own camera lens. Um, I'm wondering if there was anything that you did to map out the character's journey. Were there sort of stages of Therese that you thought of as you approached the role? Um, yeah, I mean, we, me and Todd talked a lot about that, and then the, we had two weeks of rehearsal in Cincinnati with everyone, um, and that was pretty much what we were doing in rehearsal, was just n not specifically mapping out Perez's journey, but just mapping out the entire mm -hmm. script. You know, when you shoot a film, obviously you don't shoot it in order, so you kind of have to do that with sort of every, every facet of the script. Speaking of the script, Phyllis, you knew Patricia Highsmith towards the end of her life uh, as the lovely adaptation of The Price of Salt. What was it like to translate the story's 1952 world without necessarily looking at it through a modern sensibility? It never feels like it's under a microscope. It feels very much of its time. What were some of the challenges for you? Well, I think um, really that's a, that was one of the things that I was intent on doing is to not overlay a contemporary psychology onto any of the characters. When you overlay any kind of a, and, um, a psychology, an overview, an ethos, you're, you're judging those characters immediately. And it seemed very important for all the nuances of the relationships among the, the quartet, say, the central quartet, that you don't do that. So it was very easy for me to forget about, you know, well, the first draft was many years ago, but when I started working, you know, with Todd on this, it was a pleasure to forget that we were living right now. I so, <laughs> didn't have to deal with any of the uh, methods of communication that people might have had, or the attitudes, or the judgments that are now. We all have to be very, very aware of what we're doing. And this is about instinct. Love is instinct, not calculation, although um, the circumstances of their lives um, require some calculation in dealing with it. Kyle, one of the things I love about this beautiful film is that everyone is, has got layers, everyone has got nuances, and Harj is complicated in his own right. Um, in your performance, you sort of see how confused he is that somehow he's been cheated out of the life he was expecting. How did you work to humanize him despite sort of some of the belligerence and the anger that he shows and the ways that we get to know that character? How did you get to those points underneath that? Good direction. <laughs> No, I, just listening to what, what you had just said, it, um, one of the really interesting aspects of playing this character, you know, he's, he's what he is on the screen. But the way you just spoke about how you put it together, you left everything open for, for Harge anyway, to, 
to actually do as he will and to find those spaces. And I think that was interesting because as I was playing it, it allowed me, I think at some point, I realized that it could be a stereotypical character very easily um, and portray what you would imagine a guy from the 50s under these circumstances. But what happened was, is that I, I, at some point, the worst possible moment in a man's life, or a woman, and they're in love, is when they realize they're not in love anymore. And this character never realized he wasn't in love anymore. He was always in love, and he was intensely in love. And he also had this little child. And not just his wife, not just his child, but his family unit. So important to him, and so important to say nothing of his social status and what he wasn't. But he refused to give that up. So that, what you said, allowed me, I think, and the character to, to stay within that and never lose love or respect, but still be very confused on what is going on. And which goes back to that one direction you gave me when, when you're walking in the room and I look across and I go, who are you, basically? It's like, who are? And Todd gave me a specific direction there, and it really turned me. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. And anyway, it was for me, this whole thing was so much fun, and it was really refreshing because of the, what the material is and, and, uh, and, uh, and just the way it was presented. It was, and then seeing it, it's, you know, and it was wonderful. Sarah, Abby's friendship with Carol is so meaningful, but I also see her, Abby is sort of a window into the life Carol could be leading, maybe she's sort of a guide to how to live it in some ways. Um, what were some of the keys for you as you approached it? Because she sort of seems like Abby's like a beat ahead of, obviously, of Therese and Harsh and maybe even Carol. Um, I really just tried to think about friendship and selflessness and kind of unwavering um, loyalty. Because I think Abby still has uh, feelings for Carol, and I think it's a challenging thing to... I mean, I think it's a sort of an extraordinary thing to... I planned that. <laughs> I totally planned that. There's a fire. We your answer's just too hot. Yeah, yeah be, be quiet, Paul. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, you're welcome. Is that good? Copy that. Okay. Should I... I mean, I can't compete with that. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so, Jake. So, Jake. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll answer it. No, no, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, just kidding. Uh, I do think it's a, I wonder what I personally would do if somebody I, I loved was still, um, had feelings for, if I sort of was called upon to come in and rescue the person that she currently loves. Um, I don't know, I don't know. It was to me a very big, it was a, a testament to uh, her friendship and her love, and I think the desire to be around Carol and in Carol's orbit no matter what. I think uh, Abby's sense of society, and I don't mean literal society, but her community, her friendships, you know, they were probably quite narrow at that time. And so to, to lose something like that would be, uh, the consequences of, of, of that I think would be too enormous. So I just started thinking about things like that. And beep, beep. <laughs> it's on the transcript. So I'm going to take some questions from the audience in one moment, but first I want to finish up with Jake and say that Jake, if Harge is sort of one type of guy, one type of 1952 guy, Richard is another. Uh, you know, when he says he's never been in love, and he sort of adds, until you, it's sort of like something he has to say. Uh, but there's a real nuance there, and I'm wondering if, as you were working with the character, you were finding the levels of subtlety, because it sort of feels like, you know, Richard... He really sort of wants to sort of understand something about Therese, though he calls her Terry, sort of against her, you know, it doesn't feel natural to call her Terry. But he really sort of has a sense of himself as a guy in 1952, and he asked her to marry him, and why doesn't she want to join him? Was there a subtlety there that you were sort of going for that was naturally in the, in the script? Well, I'd say it was definitely in the script. I'd say any of that subtlety is not thanks to me, <laughs> for sure. Um... Uh, you know, I do, I think Todd spoke a little when we first met about the idea that um, for Richard, like, the, the world is there to take, you know, that um, he's young, he's in New York, he's first generation American, he's smart, he's handsome, he has a job, he's got a girl, you know, like, the world is his for the taking, and, and yet it slips away from him. Um, and it's a sort of without knowing it, 
thank God that it does because otherwise he's, he's 15 years or 10 years earlier than Carol and Harge and, and that world if he and Therese stayed together and created a life that then wasn't a life anymore, you know? Um, I don't know if I can speak to the subtlety. I think that may be a viewer um, experience more than my attempt at creating something. Um, but I do think that it's really, to me, for Richard, it's a, the idea of a dream that then falls apart or someone's not willing to be a part of that dream um, and trying to wrangle them into it and they, they're not meant to be there. You know? yeah. Well, it's just interesting because I, in many ways as Carol and Therese's love stories unfolding, the, the side characters, you know, Harge is sort of represents a little bit of the past. <coughs> Richard is the future, or Abby is the future, and Richard is sort of the present, trying to understand things in a 1952 context, yeah. Let's take some questions. It's here in the front. Yeah. This is the microphone coming. Thank you. Thank you all so much for this film. Um, I have a question about the period for Director Haynes and for Ms. Blanchett and Ms. Mara. Uh, even though this is some 50-odd years ago, 60 years ago, it is sort of now a period film, and with regard to the physicality, I loved how very specifically you moved and even just the body language of that time versus today is quite different. And I wondered how you achieved that. Um, you know, even the way the cigarette is held, even, you know, the way you place a coffee cup. And also for Director Haynes, this is your third project? in this sort of time period, and I wondered what the fascination was for you about it. And also, I heard there was a Peggy Lee project as well. <laughs> well, I don't know, for me, personally, it felt less about the period and more about what Todd was referring to before about the gaze. Um, and so if the cigarette was held in a certain way and received by the camera in a certain way, it's because it was being viewed through the prism of someone's desire rather than the prism of the period. And one of the most revelatory things that, that Todd showed all of us, but, but I found really useful, was a film called Lovers and Lollipops. And in fact, it completely subverted everything that I'd seen on the 50s represented in film before. It was so fresh and immediate, I felt like it was happening right then and there in front of me. It was people in clothes, not in costumes, um, existing and behaving with one another, just as we do now. And I think when you experience a love story, whether it's back in the 1400s in China or in, you know, in 1952 in, in New York, it's, it feels as if it's, it's this timeless connection. It doesn't, so the period is an important impediment and all good dramas need you know, hurdles to be gotten over by the protagonists, but it, it, it came secondary. Although the girdles I don't know, <laughs> did influence the way, you know, there was a scene where, <laughs> where um, Rooney was playing the piano, Therese was playing the piano and I was... I found this position on the floor, and I, ha I thought, I have to be graceful, and I, I rehearsed a lot so I could get up in one movement. <laughs> you guys have actually looked at a lot of photography, right, Todd? You guys have looked at some 50s style photography from Ruth Orkin. We, we okay. did, and Ruth Orkin is one of the, the color photographers that we looked at, who was photographing New York City in color at the time. But Ruth Orkin was the partner of Morris Engel, who, these are all New York-based artists and photojournalists and uh, 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 sorry, uh, my brain. Um, they did uh, um, psychodramas. I mean, with, uh, not documentaries. Uh, but uh, the Little Fugitive is the best known of, of their films, their collaborations, and they would use sort of unknown actors, putting them in real locations, using natural light. The Little Fugitive is the story of a little kid who runs away to Coney Island during the day. But Lovers and Lollipops, they made a few years later, and uh, it was set in locations more relevant to our film, and, but it had a, a woman at the center of the story, a story of a single mother trying to ingratiate her daughter to a new boyfriend. And she was just a woman. Uh, she was not a, a wealthy woman like Carol, but she was a woman with this tremendous poise and this gait and this manner of speech. And it was a kind of example of a femininity that we do, just do not see anymore. It's a, you might glimpse it in your grandmother, but it's something that is not produced anymore culturally. And yet it's not something you would see by actresses in 
Hollywood films from the period. So it gave an insight to something quite specific and sort of lost that I thought would be really useful to Kate, to Kate and Rooney. Uh, yes, right here, the second row. Good morning, this is for Kate and Rooney. What I love so much about this film is the love story between the two of you, and it didn't feel like it was a, a homosexual love story. It felt very heterosexual, if I may. So. If you can talk about that, how it's That's normal. Yeah, exactly. So if you can discuss that, is it because of the times that we're living in now? Is that the reason why we don't care anymore? Um, I don't know that it, I mean, to me there is no difference, so it's kind of a difficult question to answer. I think one of the great film, things about the film is that it's not a political film, it's not a film with an agenda, and we're not preaching to the audience, and so people are allowed to just watch it for what it is, which is a love story between two humans. You on the left side? Yeah, okay. Uh, this question is for Phyllis. Uh, I haven't read the Patricia Smith, uh, Highsmith, excuse me, uh, novel, but I was wondering, you, you, you mentioned at the beginning uh, that uh, Carol obviously is risking so much, her marriage, her child, and I'm wondering if it was in the text uh, or if you, how you grappled with making her risk worth it, considering the loss of a child, potentially of a child, as, and also, um, uh, yeah, if it was in the text and how you made her uh, uh, sympathetic and where, of course, we want to root for her. Well, um, it's interesting you mentioned her marriage because I think her marriage is over. She's not, she's not risking her marriage at all, and that is in uh, the Patricia Highsmith novel. She is risking the ability to have her child with her in the moment after this divorce happens. I don't think she ever risks, in her heart, she's not giving up her child. She is allowing her child to grow up for the moment in the environment that's best for her because Carol is being a good mother in, in allowing the child to be with Harge. Carol must be who she is. She's not yet who she is. And in order to be good for her child and not screw her up later on, she's got to do this. It's actually quite selfless and I don't think it has to do with being with Therese. I think those two things are separate. But I, but I would add that she's also exerting an authority over the situation by, by basically in a veiled threat to Harge, by saying, I want to see Rindy on my terms, and if not, this may come to court and this may get ugly. And one could only imagine how ugly this could get for someone like Harge and his family if this really did get played out in the courts. So she end, ends up actually holding a lot, the, the, the reins in her hand about how and when she gets to see her daughter. And that would, had not been the case up till that point in the story. And, and that wasn't, it, it, Highsmith allows us a great freedom in the novel with the character of Carol, whose own narrative is relayed almost exclusively through Therese's eyes. So we get these shards, these mosaic pieces of Carol's life, and now Carol is doing this, and, and now I heard she was, you know, having a custody battle. But so it gave us great freedom because there is no big moment with Carol and Harge like that in the book to actually explore some of these things and the power dynamic so that it is less about um, will I lose my child? I personally don't think she's ever in danger of losing Rindy in a real sense. But it is interesting, because what your question does point to is the fact that if a mother makes a choice based on her own survival, that she risks losing the audience's sympathy. And I don't, you know, if it was a, a, a gay man, somehow his, his, I don't think the question of sympathy would arise. And whenever one plays a mother on screen, there's always a sense that there's a right way to parent and that you lose your identity and you become a mother first and foremost. And I, you know, I, I think that that's what I loved about Todd, is we didn't ever talk about sympathy. 
And personally, as an actor, I, I find the idea of playing for an audience as sympathy a kind of repulsive <laughs> um, in, endeavor. Um, you know, it's like saying, like me, like me. I think it's a terrible, terrible position, a tragic position that uh, Carol has been placed in. Uh, and Hodge has been placed in, frankly. You know, when she says in the, in the lawyer's office, we're not ugly people, Hodge. I think that's when the threat goes out of it. It's like, that is the truth. You are not like this at your heart if you take away all the trappings of society. I am not like this. Um, and I think that's the issue. And the wonderful thing about working with Tom is we didn't ever discuss the sympathy, the S word. <laughs> and another factor of that is it's so resonant when she says, what good am I if I'm with my, to my daughter if I'm living against my own grain? That's very important that she has to live her own way. That's exactly right. You in the back? Uh, Left-hand side, front row. Kyle, Kate, and Rooney. Is this a classic case of the heart wants what the heart wants? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> I also think that towards that end, when Kyle, when Hart is looking through that, that doorway at Abby's, it's sort of, it's, it's interesting because speaking a little bit to what you're saying, um, there's a world going on around him that he's not privy to, that he's not allowed into, and he's confused by it. So his heart may want something else, but there's this whole other situation that these other two hearts have going on that he just doesn't understand. He's not able to, to unlock it, right, Todd? Is that a, a fair assessment of that scene? Well, yes, clearly. I mean, I think you see the two sort of... Uh, satellites, yeah. the key sort of power brokers on either side of Carol's life, coming to, in a direct conflict with each other in that scene. And it's the only scene that neither Carol or T Therese witness in the film, but I think that gives it an extra kind of uh, force. But it's an essential scene, and, it, and, it, and it's a showdown of, about people who love Carol in different ways and sort of keep disavowing the other person's side. But they're strong people, too. And I, you know, the interesting thing about Kyle's character, Harge, is that we are introduced to Harge at an uncustomary period in his, in his life as a character. One presumes that Harge has always pretty much taken Carol for granted most of their life. But when the film begins, he's already sort of reevaluated her value in his life and the way he's inviting her out and wanting to have time, spend time with her and share time with her seems to be a new project, a new regimen. Uh, right here, middle row on the right-hand side. Uh, there are some very interesting moments that speak of addiction uh, that counters the desire moments, the smoking I'm uh, talking about, that when Carol uh, wants the cigarettes, uh, uh, in that in that scene, could you talk about where uh, the smoking comes in? There's another scene where some a woman is hiding her smoking. They all have their secrets. Yeah. Well, it's 1952. Everybody smokes. <laughs> but smoking is the perfect sort of conductor of desire because it's a way in which you seek desire and you never fulfill it. So it's this practiced. I mean, I know this from being an ex-smoker. We have talked about this. It's a practiced uh, sort of cycle where you seek being satisfied, you crave that moment, but you're always chasing an original moment that you never get back to in that cigarette. And so, of course, it's played a key symbolic role in the history of Hollywood Golden Age cinema and the history of films about women and the ways in which anxieties and desires are... Um, you know, displaced into other kinds of practices. Um, but I don't see it as much more than that in this film. But that was a great description. <laughs> I really want to say that right now. Oh my God. I'm going to sit off. I'm going to sit off of that for a second to talk about something else that's a signifier in some ways in the film, which is the way it was shot, the 16 millimeter. Can you talk to us a little bit, Todd, about the, the choice to shoot the film in 16 millimeter and having it be so era specific but also very evocative at the same time? Ed Lockman, the director of photography, and I had worked with on Super 16 in our previous project, Mildred Pierce, which was going ultimately broadcast for, for HDTV on HBO. And we wanted to really um, downgrade 
the, the sort of sophistication of, of lenses and stocks today, where the grain element just continually goes away. You don't even know you you shot on film if you shot on 35 sometimes and it blows up to, 30, to HD. And uh, we loved it. We had a really great time on that project. And the, the research for Carol kept revealing this, this city in a very early stage of transition out of the war years. The early 1950s were something quite different from the Eisenhower war years that we mostly attribute to that shiny, glossy decade. Um, and I was quite interested in, and curious about how different this world looked than the world perhaps in my film, Far From Heaven. Um, and we wanted to bring some of that sootiness and some of that sort of uh, you know, monochromatic color palette to the look of the film. And so the 16 millimeter was one of the ways that we did that. Uh, we also found a beautiful city that had architectural integrity and was really preserved in its past in many blocks and in many of the interiors we found in Cincinnati, Ohio. We just loved what Cincinnati offered, the look of the film. We in the back, uh, Grace shirt there on the left. Hi. Um, another one of the things I noticed was obviously the two women are in very different life stages. Um, Carol being more established and having children and married. Older. Older. Yeah. <laughs> no, but also, but that doesn't always say that. Um, I think it would be very different had Carol been a man. Obviously, it becomes a different story because she is kind of helping Therese sort of find herself and asking her questions and encouraging her to do new things. Um, I wonder if that gave you more, because you're both women, it gave more freedom for it not to feel like for lack of a better term, like predatory. Um, that's it. That, maybe that was a sloppy question, but I hope you understand what I mean. I mean, I don't know. Would it ever feel predatory? I mean, it's not like I'm 17 years old. Therese, you know, Therese is is um, younger than Carol, and she she certainly they are at different stages in their lives. But I, I don't think that she's so young that it would. It, it never felt predatory to me, and I don't think it ever really would have male or female. Um. I mean, the interesting thing about this is the obsession, and, and actually perhaps more so in, in, in the book, there's this, there's this pursuit, this obsessive pursuit that, that um, Therese has of, of, of Carol, and because of Carol's sense of consequence um, and the, you know, the difference in, in their ages and experiences and also their different socioeconomic backgrounds, it's, you know, there's a sense of just how we have to quiet the horses here and not go too quickly with this because I, I know that this is not necessarily going to end uh, well. So it's kind of in a way that she's just... Uh, that, but that's delicious stuff to play with because that's what, that's what loads up all those silences. And every word is, is not only carefully chosen by the beautiful screenplay but by the women. Can I say this? This might have two meanings. I'm not sure if that was taken the right way. Did I just hear what I thought you were saying behind what you just said. You know, it's wonderful stuff to play with this because there's so much stuff um, be between them and keeping them apart. There are also things that a modern audience has to keep reminding ourselves were quite different at this time where, counterintuitively, where an older woman could invite a younger woman to lunch and it was absolutely totally appropriate where she would never have invited the head of the ski department to lunch or they could check into a motel together as two women, but if they were a heterosexual unmarried women, a couple checking into a hotel at, at this time, it would have been scandalous. So there's ways in which the, the mores and the codes of the time are also things that we're learning and reading against their actions and gestures. Plus, let's not forget, Therese knows what she's doing when she sends the package, when she sends the gloves back to, yeah, she absolutely yes. knows what she's doing, yes. yeah. Uh, in the back, right-hand side, you're up right in the aisle. My question is for Ms. Blanchett. Um, you first were in Patricia Heisman's work with the talented Mr. Ripley, which I think is a marvelous film. And I was wondering if you encountered um, The Price of Salt while you were working on that, and if your perception of the story changed having portrayed Carol. Yes, it's one thing entirely reading a novel and then, and then reading it again when you're coming to play a character in that, that book. I mean, I just read everything I could of, of hers at the time they were making uh, Ripley. It was actually much to my shame the first time I encountered her work. Um, 
But I also was very interested in, the, you know, all of the sort of the filmic in, incarnations of her, um, of, of, of her of her works as well, and, and went back and revisited it. And there's some wonderful, um, you know, observations and in parts of internal monologue that both, well, more internal monologue that Therese has, but observations of Carol that are in the novel that were really, really useful to read that I just read at the time, um, the first time I, I read the book um, as, a, as a reader, but to then to try and make that stuff manifest was really exciting. Phyllis, you, did Patricia want the film, did want the novel to be made into film? Was she nervous about it? What were her thoughts about it? Well, she was dead by the time oh, this came to me, <laughs> so we didn't um, have that conversation, but I do know that... Uh, <laughs> I'll have it with her later tonight. Um, <laughs> she didn't like many of the film adaptations of her work. Even the, did she? Oh, no, she couldn't stand them. Especially Strangers on a Train, oh, oh, right? Oh, what does she know? <laughs> She's dead, so let's <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, from her perspective, that, the, the, the guys trade murders in that book, and the film, um, of course, they don't. And it was one of the first arguments we had when I said, oh, I love Strangers on a Train. She said, hmm, <laughs> really? With disgust. <laughs> but, but she liked aspects of the films. Robert Walker she loved, and um, she thought Alain Delon was extremely attractive, in, uh, of course. So I, 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 I hope that she would um, find this entire enterprise extremely attractive. Um, I think she would. I think we are, all of us, um, not betraying uh, the intent and the tone of her work, which really, I think, is the only thing that you can do. Um, it, to be reverent to a source material, everything else is up for grabs. Way in the back, uh, hand far right. Todd, can you um, comment on Kyle's performance and the qualities in him as an actor that caused you to cast him in this role? And Kate, can you comment on working with Kyle and his process? He loves things without a train. <laughs> well, um, you the alarm anytime you want. <laughs> can I say I, we, I, I just so lucked out. I mean, I've been watching Kyle's work and been so amazed by it, as I'm sure most of you guys have in in uh, you know Friday Night Lights and films he's been in, and. and you know, casting a man to play opposite Kate Blanchett is not an obvious task. Uh, because a lot of male actors today are kind of grown up boys or something, or wear their baseball caps still or something. And it just doesn't, you need to have a real grown up, I think, opposite. Kate. <laughs> and we found an animal. <laughs> Kyle. Um, no, but it's true. You need. You know, and I think you get what I mean. And because it's even just the way he enters that era with such a sense of believability. It's like the, the, I saw him in the clothes the first time, and I was like, I think you said you've done a early dramatic TV show in the fifth, set in the fifties. Home front, the 40s. home front, in the forties. But it just suited him so well. It was so utterly believable, <laughs> you know. And uh, but you know, this started with the writing. Uh, the way Harge is handled as a character and Richard is Highsmith is quite diff hard on these men in the book, and so Phyllis brought a very different kind of complexity and uh, ambiguity to the characters. And you felt, un you understood that they were in a place without any examples around them for what they were going through. And they were struggling and they were doing their very best and they were lashing out at times and being reactive or being defensive, but they were human. And I think Kyle just brings that completely to, to the front of the film. Kyle and, and Kate, did you guys have a favorite scene that you worked on together that you really loved? Was there one one? Kyle has a really favorite yeah. scene. The dancing scene. No. <laughs> oh. 
I tamed her feet during the dance. I'll tell you that. Anyway, yeah, we, we know we had dance classes together, which was interesting. Oh, yes. <laughs> You've never done any film where you look so afraid. Is that right? Yeah. Dancing with me. My favorite scene was the one where I fell that 18 times. <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. Speaking about the men in the book, Phyllis and Jake, the, Richard is handled much more, he's much more brutal in the book, he's much more angry in the book as the book goes on. Um, we see a little less of that in, in the film. Was that, uh, was that just sort of the natural consequence of having that character recede, uh, or did you ever have a moment where you wanted to make him a little angrier towards, towards Therese? Well, I think... I, my, I suppose my intention was just to, um, you know, I'm not a psychopath, I can't really enter into the heads of imaginary characters, but insofar as one can, um, that's what I try to do. I am those people. How would I feel? How would I behave on a basic level? And certainly, I empathize, I suppose, with these men um, and with the other young men in the film who's also after Therese, at least momentarily. Um, so it becomes easy, once you do that, to just have people behave in a way that you imagine they would. I mean, if I were hard, I'd be pissed off too. And similarly with Richard, he's given no clue, really, and perhaps he's not so great on picking up on them. But still, um, Therese is... is quite reticent and quite internal. So I think it's hard to please someone like that. So that's really um, all it is, I think. But I think you do reach a greater point of understanding of the men's dilemma in your screenplay than you do in, in the novel, because it's from, from Therese's perspective, and obviously Hodge is a, you know, she, all, all Therese is seeing from afar is that is the, the damage that she perceives has been done by, to, to Carol by Hodge. And what is stopping her is this constant pulling at her from behind um, by, by Richard. So it's, there's an, an annoyance with those two men that is part of her youth, but also part of you know, her, her thought of desire. And, I'm, and, and what, what I think what Phyllis has clearly done, what Todd definitely did with the, the filmmaking, is that you you might start off with that in the perspective, say, that the first argument that Therese witnesses Hodge and um, Carol having is seen through doorways, a bit like watching your parents argue. You know, but then you come to a point, a greater point of understanding of, of the two men's positions, I think. Mm -hmm. Richard also even feels kind of brotherly in some ways to Therese. He feels, right, Jake, he kind of almost in some ways has a sense of like just a brotherly sort of sense to her. He doesn't, he doesn't feel like so much like a suitor as he does like a, a best friend. Yeah, I think uh, for Richard, you know, I think he's under the impression that this is like a great love, and and it's probably his first, and so maybe there's more down the road, you know, that that sheds light in the future for him as to what this really was. But for him, then he feels like this is the one that's getting away, you know. And I think there's also, I think for all these characters, I think for Richard in particular, there's a complete lack of vocabulary, a complete loss for how to describe this or experience it, and is is searching for someone to put a label onto what this problem is, and, and even Therese is unable to define that for him as she's going through it. Um, and that speaks to Richard, I think, and to the time that they're living in. There's an element of, of this discussion of, like, we're walking, and I, Therese asks if I know anyone like that, and and Richard says he does, but that it's usually like something in their past, as if it's like a psychiatric condition that someone would be homosexual. Mm -hmm. And that's the most definition he has for what's going on. And so rather than being aggressive about it, he's just at a complete loss as to how to make heads or tails of this situation. We have time for one more question. Uh, over here, far right. A beautiful film to look at, a beautiful script for the actors to play. But the question I have to do with, is with the erotic, the nakedness of the erotic desire in terms of class privilege. In literature like Foster, it trumps class privilege, but it usually comes back to bite you, and it does in this film too. So could you talk a little deeper about that intersection, Todd? 
of class privilege and erotic desire? Well, I guess I don't particularly isolate uh, the privilege of desire with Carol, who has the class privilege between the two women. I think the, the intense state of desire that, that we understand Carol through, that we keep filtering Carol through, is of course being cast by Therese's desire for her. And in a way, the, that, is the, that is the machine that is moving the narrative forward through a good part of the film, is Therese's desire. And Carol, there are moments where you, you wonder how she feels about Therese. There are moments where it feels like a detour from her life. It feels like a, a sidebar, um, an outlier to, to the issues that she has to confront. That, that she at, probably at times wonders or feels embarrassed about. And I, am I really spending all this time with this girl who really is just taking form in front of me? I think all of that gets reevaluated later in the film, and, it, and it's most articulated in that scene with Sarah uh, toward the end of the movie, where they're both kind of stripped down, and you see a side of Carol we haven't seen before. But I, I even though Rooney is literally the one being explored physically or, or sexually or revealed more in that sex scene. It feels like that's something that Therese is conducting as much as uh, Carol. And maybe as a parallel to that, there is sort of a sense too, as we mentioned earlier, that, that Therese has got opportunities that Carol never had, and there's sort of a, a sense of not so much class, but also just a, a different stages of life and different places yeah. that they've opened up. And that line that Carol gives that people have brought up to me and, and was even a point of questioning when we were making the film when Carol looks at Therese's body and says, I've never, I never look like that. Uh, a kind of expression of intimacy that is hard to find a parallel to among gay men, and certainly not heterosexual couples. It's something pretty unique to what two women might be able to say to each other. Um, even though you kind of look at Kate and go, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 To wrap up, I just want to comment that the film is so graceful and so elegant. I'm wondering that uh, for all of you, kind of moving on to ne your next projects, there's probably no way you can't take some of the beautiful emotionalism of this project with you as you move on. Did anybody have anything that you just sort of thought about as you as you left the project and moved on that you took with you from this film? No. I'll say so. Please. The last scene in the film. The last scene in the film the strength and the power and the conviction and the heroism of Kate's character in all the moments that happened in that room and allowing the other character to look at this woman as someone that is not his wife anymore alone, but someone he has respect for and looks up to, created a whole new type of love, if you will, for the characters to go on as they do into the 60s and the 70s and what have you. And I thought that was, it sort of gives me chills because it worked up to that. That was really, it's a beautiful, strengthful, uh, strengthful. Uh, from Texas, I'm sorry. It was very strengthful. It was just, it was very powerful. And I think there's a reflection of what that is today, if you will, and the conscience of, of, of what's happening present. That, that It's that love. I think that, that was really powerful. Well, I can't think of any end shot, any end smile at the end of a film that means more or is as full of emotion as the one that's at the end of this film. And ladies and gentlemen, please give a big hand to the cast and crew of Carol. Uh,